Sleepy Tea, or Dream Tea in this case, from a company called Rich and Poor Co. I love that name. As an herbal tea, this one's also made to help you sleep with ingredients like chamomile and valerian. Quick thing though, valerian is pretty strong, so pace yourselves. And if it's a little bit too strong and you feel groggy the next day, maybe dial it back a little bit. Boiling hot water for at least five minutes. Uh, longer is totally fine as this is an herbal tea, but not too long after all. You gotta drink it and head to bed. A trend that has really picked up steam recently is sleep tracking, especially in the form of health tracking wearables. Suddenly there are so many new sleep tracking products in the market that come in different forms. You have the classic smartwatch, a new crop of smart rings, and even tracking things through sleep earbuds. It would seem that if you really want to optimize your sleep by watching all of that data, you have multiple ways of getting that info on a nightly basis. And as this year comes to a close, I find myself thinking about a time when I was literally using all three types of these devices to do just that. Okay, cards on the table. Please bear with me as I finally get around to doing some videos that I had planned months ago during my long trip to Japan, a trip that holds multiple fantastic memories for me, as well as plenty of opportunities to do some testing and some content that I don't normally have the ability to back home. Case in point, in this video, I'm going to be looking back at the time I wore three different sleep tracking products and compared them to actual sleep lab data. And that sleep lab, a capsule hotel in the heart of Tokyo, Japan. So let's see how accurate wearables like these really are for tracking sleep. And you can join me on a trip down memory lane during one of my favorite times of this past year. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? These are sleep gadgets versus an actual sleep lab. A few things I feel like need to be addressed before recounting the story. First off, yes, this night came in the middle of a workation of sorts that I had way back in May or June of this year when my partner and I went to Tokyo for her first ever trip to Japan. Staying at the Capsule Hotel was actually her idea because she once watched an old Travel Channel documentary episode about Japan and it highlighted Capsule Hotels and it became a dream of hers to try one ever since. Now, if you don't already know, Capsule Hotels are a particularly Japanese form of accommodation that gives you a super small space to literally stay in for just the night. The concept was originally meant to be space-saving in a place so dense and busy like Tokyo, but also time-saving considering people might just need a place to crash between work events or interviews, or maybe they just missed the last train to head back home. They have become a real tourist attraction, taking on many different vibes or even forms. As a matter of fact, a while back, I stayed at one at a trendy capsule hotel, and I actually filmed a video there that you can find way deep back in my channel here. That capsule hotel looked like a library that you could actually pick and read books and manga off of, uh, but in this case right now, it just so happens that one of the main capsule hotel chains called Nine Hours happens to have a location that literally tracks your sleep as you stay there. The Nine Hours Sleep Lab literally has sensors all over the capsule that you will end up calling home for the night, complete with microphones and cameras. The hotel does make it clear that all the data that is recorded is completely anonymized, with the results only being sent the one time to the email address that you have on file. The idea here is an accessible way to get this level, this depth, this quality of sleep analysis that should be far more comprehensive than something a smartwatch might be able to provide. You're right to feel a little skeptical. After all, there are a lot of factors that can keep your sleep in this situation from being properly indicative of your actual nightly routine. Not only are these capsules far from the comforts that I would have back home, like here, this particular night is part of a trip where everything about my daily routine has been different. I'm in a foreign country. I'm eating my way through one of the best food cities in the world. Not to mention, I am letting myself have things that most people would agree affect sleep in almost any amount. I mean, for example, just before before the appointed time, we went out for a bit of yakiniku, Japanese barbecue, which also included a couple of drinks. But the point of this particular experiment isn't necessarily the optimization of my sleep. That's an ongoing journey that can include that sleep capsule sleep lab, but also includes the wearables as I have them on all the time. Instead, it's about seeing how close the lab's data will be to the wearables I brought for the job. The Garmin Venue 3 smartwatch, the Aura Ring, and the newest addition to my sleep routine, the Soundcore Sleep A20 earbuds. This Aura Ring probably needs no introduction. If you're at all interested in sleep tracking, you know this wearable. It is consistently hailed as one of the most accurate and most insightful sleep trackers on the market, providing not just a look into sleep quality, but extrapolating all of that into a snapshot of your overall health with the help of all-day heart rate monitoring and metrics like heart rate variability that have become increasingly common in wearables that we've seen here in the back half of 2024. 
And then I went with the Garmin Venue 3 for a couple of simple reasons. In the world of smartwatches from the likes of Samsung, Google, and Apple, long battery life is still hard to achieve. Since Garmin sticks to its own, admittedly more simplistic OS over something like Wear OS, it can easily hit like five days of general fitness and sleep tracking, all while allowing me still glances at my notifications. Without going too hard into like the running aesthetics and the capabilities of things like the heavier duty Phoenix series. And finally, there's the Soundcore Sleep A20. Sleep buds may not be something many of you are very familiar with, and while I was in Japan, I was still new to them. As someone that likes to have something playing in my ears most of the day, it did kind of make sense to have that option when trying to fall asleep, and in a pair of earbuds that would both stay in and remain comfortable even if I'm sleeping on my side. Those are the main selling points of these earbuds, as they claim to be really good for side sleepers, which includes yours truly. And while other sleep buds would just feed calming sounds to you as you tried to drift asleep, which is a good thing, these would give you the option of staying straight up Bluetooth headphones so that I can fall asleep listening to like podcasts or Smosh Reddit stories. Ultimately, they're just super comfortable. This is supposed to be a sleep tracking test, of course, so these earbuds have to have their own data collection system and we'll be comparing aspects of each product against the sleep lab. And after all of that, it's time to sleep. We head back to the nine hour sleep lab and gather our belongings before separating to our respective gendered floors. Like most capsule hotels, pods are just for single sleepers and genders are usually separated to their own areas. Upon check-in, you're given some consent forms, a bag of some amenities like a set of pajamas, and access cards for your pod, the locker room, and the bathroom facilities. Capsule hotels can feel a little bit like hostels in the sense that most things provided are communal, but the pods are separated and provide privacy covers. One thing you do have to consider when sleeping in capsules is the sound leakage. People in Japanese establishments like this tend to be pretty mindful of their surroundings and remain pretty quiet, but once people are asleep, there's no telling what would happen. There could be movement and snoring that you can hear through the walls of the pods. That's another reason why the sleep buds might make sense as an addition to a light sleeper's nightly routine. I tend to be a heavier sleeper, so the noise is not much of a problem, but the earbuds are still appreciated. The capsules do have some amenities within them, from plugs for charging any items to build in fans for airflow. The ambient temperature of hotels like this is usually quite cold, but the hotel does provide all of the sheets and a thick blanket for keeping warm during the night. And with that, the privacy cover was pulled down on my upper level capsule, my phone was put aside, alarms were set on the Garmin Venue 3 and in the earbuds actually, and then the lights were turned off. I let the wearables figure out on their own when I would actually fall asleep, and the sleep buds were set on a sleep timer in the connected app to stop playing my podcast after two hours. And with that, a good night. It was actually the alarm in the sleep buds that woke me up, as it has a few different alarm sounds to choose from. That coupled with the good vibration motor of the Garmin made for a nice, basically silent way to alarm me awake without disturbing other people around me. The same couldn't really be said for a couple of other patrons of this nine hours hotel. Oh well. But right off the bat, I felt somewhat rested, but maybe not exceptionally refreshed. The bed isn't the most comfortable, as I'm used to a larger mattress and this is a flatter, almost futon-like experience that is much more in line with the typical minimalist Japanese bedroom. I checked in with my girlfriend and she lets me know that she didn't sleep super well, which might have been expected. She is a light sleeper and a little bit pickier about her comfort, so sleeping in a foreign place both literally and figuratively is a lot to ask. On the topic of the earbuds, uh, my partner, who was in the women's only section, so I didn't get to talk to her about her experience until just this morning, she said that it actually took her a while to fall asleep, and one of the main reasons why is because you could hear other people coming into the sleep area. That's where something like the earbuds would come in handy, uh, because obviously you are masking or blocking out a lot of that noise, either through the passive noise cancellation or via some of the media that you're listening to. Points to the Soundcore Sleep A20 in this case. Upon checkout, we're told that the sleep results are sent out every Thursday, so if it's not ready that next Thursday, they will be sent the following Thursday. It turns out they were ready right away, and I get the email within a couple of days with a PDF showing my sleep lab results. Which brings us to now, where I will look at the sleep lab results from nine hours and then compare them to the data that my wearables got. That's another thing that you have to give these wearables credit for. You will always have the data. I'm actually gonna go all the way back to May. <laughs> uh, even months and months later, I'm going back to May. All the data is still stored in the cloud and I'll be able to see uh, what the Aura, the Garmin, and even the earbuds were able to get me. So here are some of the main reactions that I have here. 
The total sleep time, the total time resting is actually about the same across the board, which is nice to see. The one thing that is a little bit weird among all of the data is that my deep sleep uh, is a lot longer in the sleep lab than it is on any of the wearables. That being said, the wearables all had fairly short deep sleeps, and I don't know, I guess I need to work on that in the future. Also, I don't really know if the nine hour sleep lab just measures uh, deep sleep in a different way, if its sensors are actually in the bed or anything like that, if it's not perceiving any movement from me. There could be other ways that the sleep lab is trying to recognize deep sleep compared to what is on my wrist and on my finger. And on that note, um, the readiness scores uh, and the body battery, if you are wearing the Garmin, those are all things that are rather subjective. Sure, it's a good measure of what you can do that day based upon how well you slept or how well you rested, but at the end of the day, it's still all about listening to your body. But for the Aura, it is a big selling point because it has pioneered sort of the whole heart rate variability data in its metrics, and it's using that in order to tell you, well, today you can push yourself a little bit farther or since your heart rate variability or HRV might be quite low, uh, then maybe it's time to just take it easy on this next day. Here's a fun one, rollover stats. Uh, inside of the pod, there are pro there's definitely that camera, but there might also be other sensors that are just sensing when you are moving around, whether it's rolling over completely or just sort of shifting around. Now, even somebody who seems to be a pretty heavy sleeper, you'll end up rolling over at least 10 or so times, and that's according to the info that the sleep lab gives you to give you some insight into their data. And according to the info, if you are rolling over or moving around, that promotes blood flow and blood circulation, so that's a plus, uh, even if you roll over more than you feel like you should. And the earbuds were basically in line with the sleep lab as far as how many times I turned over, which I thought was pretty cool. And it also makes sense because the earbuds probably have sensors like accelerometers, uh, and it also knows when there's pressure being added to one of the sides since I would be sleeping on that side. And really, all of this data just kind of tells me that all the wearables look like they're giving a good general look into the data with insights varying by product. After all, each company is going to give you different pieces of advice, generally good advice uh, across all of them, but maybe different things that they're focusing on depending on which products you're looking at. As with all health trackers, it's up to you to make sure that you're making the adjustments in order to improve the numbers that these things are giving you. This is also true of the Sleep Lab, which makes an effort to provide insight and actionable steps. Each type of thing that they measure comes with some general information. Like for example, the average Japanese person sleeps between seven and eight hours somehow. Um, and there is a follow-up email that comes later in case you want to schedule an appointment with a sleep specialist if you really want to do something about the results, whether they are good or bad. Now there is one other thing that the sleep lab really focuses on and that is sleep apnea. Monitoring breathing and breathing abnormalities provides a look into whether you have a bigger problem and nine hours gives a range that could be alarming if you're way outside of that threshold. I am apparently on the cusp of having some sort of very mild apnea with the breathing abnormalities hitting 15 times per hour. Uh, thankfully, I only had one time per hour that I just stopped breathing for more than 10 seconds, which that one is a much bigger deal. And it was right after this trip to Tokyo and the sleep lab that fitness wearables and sleep trackers started trying to add apnea detection to their software and their algorithms. The Galaxy Ring and the Ultra Human Ring are big examples of this push. All in all, it's hard to say whether or not the wearables are completely accurate because even the sleep lab can have its own variables. They say themselves that they aren't using full-on medical devices, so they are not at liberty to make actual diagnosis, diagnoses, diagno, diagnoses? The point of this experiment was more curiosity, to see if something potentially more robust, like a whole sleep capsule filled with sensors and even a camera, could dispel or maybe even support wearables many of us use. In finding a good amount of the data lining up, I think we mostly find that these wearables are pretty accurate, other than maybe the one metric of deep sleep that could just be differences in cultural or Japan's own method of measurement, who knows. But what this all does remind me is that no matter what wearable or sleep tracking you're employing, the data is there for a reason. And that reason is for you to do something to make the results go in a positive direction. And I'm sure I can speak for most of us when I say, that is usually the hardest part. So maybe in this new upcoming year, it would be good to take the things that smartwatches or smart rings say a little more seriously and make the adjustments so that we can all sleep a little easier. And so there you have it, some fun for me to revisit one of the best memories of this past year while giving you a bit of information after a random but honestly cool test that I got to do in Tokyo. I mean, where else could I not only sleep in a capsule, but also get my sleep analyzed and then compared to the data from my wearables? I feel like that's only in Japan. 
Let me know your thoughts about this little test I did and let me know how you track and improve your sleep and your lives in the comments downstairs. But from there, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for hanging out with me again today. Please take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy your tea, everybody. Sleepy tea and valerian for me right now because I'm going to bed dreaming about the trip that I had earlier this year. Hope I can do it again soon.